Okay. Looks like we're live. We're live. Welcome. Tuesday, November 22nd, 2022. Welcome to the Anyone Can Farm Experience live chat <clears throat> here at lovely Baker's Green Acres in Marion, Michigan. I am your host, Mark, coming to you from Baker's Green Acres. And let's see. We are going to have a blast tonight. I got a good good show for you tonight. <clears throat> um, been looking forward to this. Um, all is well here. Uh, let's see. Yeah, I had a, a little bit of problems. Some of you may know uh, we had some high winds, and it. I was framing another building, a small building. <clears throat> it's a small one, just to put tractors in, and uh, the wind blew the uh, trusses over. So I had, I don't know, about a a half a day's worth of work into it. And when I was butchering turkeys yesterday, I heard this crash and I looked over and, oh, good. And uh, I had about 50 turkeys to go. So that was not the greatest experience. But, you know, to, as we speak now, what's going on? Nothing. Oh, oh we're not plugged in? Yeah, Keith working. Sutton's here in me. Yeah, it's working. This will just make it work better. Okay. My you technical advisor to... just came in and is going to make things better. Sharpen the stick a Keep little bit. Get up off the computer a little bit because it picks up all the engine noise when it's okay. Clear. Okay. Well, great. It's nice to have a great staff to come and look out for me. Hi, Belva. Hi, Keith. Welcome. <clears throat> Glad everybody could make it. Um, what's going on in the world here? Uh, off grid with Dave and Sonia. Been seeing some correspondence from Sonia on my feed. I just see it, but I don't read it. I because I think it has to do with uh, with Jill, not me. And then Dion's with us, and Jeremy Huggins is with us. Welcome, welcome. Good to have the Air Force with us. <laughs> uh, okay, so uh. Around here, uh, we just, yesterday was our last day of poultry processing, and my crew was ecstatic. ecstatic. And it's kind of interesting to have this subject for tonight. It looks like everything's okay. Let me know if things aren't working out, you guys. Uh, the subject for tonight is how to set up a butcher shop. And this is going to be sponsored by CSA Turkeys and Chickens, Baker's Green Acres, of course, and the Tribe Plus. If you're not a member of the Tribe Plus, do us a solid. Get over there to the Anyone Can Farm Experience.com and click on join tribe plus and do us a favor and help us out with uh, shouldering the expenses of this endeavor that we're on. We ain't even close. Not where we're going, boys. We're not even close. Let me tell you. A lot of things are happening right now. I don't know what that means. When we get an oops, we lost a person too. All right, I'll just keep going. Um, all right, so our chicken processing this year grew in leaps and bounds. Normally, we are processing one day a week, and these these chickens that we're processing are do not belong to us. It's a service that we're providing to our community. And people bring them in on Thursday evening, drop them off, and then we get up Friday morning and we just throw down and get those babies done. Well, uh, this year it hasn't been enough to just work uh, Friday morning and, and noon. It usually takes us a full shift. You know, we're getting done at uh, about five or six o'clock in the evening. 
and we usually do, you know, up to 250 birds, not, not always, but up to, and my helpers are my kids and I have a niece and nephew that help, uh, a buddy of mine, uh, that lives locally, his kids helped us this summer. And it's never been something that we thought that, hey, this is what we want to do in life is butcher chickens. No, that's not it. Actually, we didn't even try to do this. Uh, I was going to butcher my own chickens. And when we first moved here, there was a, a kind of a flat spot down there by where the butcher shop is now. And uh, there was some old concrete there. There had been a building there. We did not know what it was. And so we kind of used that flat spot. And there was an, an old freezer there. You know, like a chest freezer. It was, there was a lot of junk on this farm when we bought it. A lot of junk. I mean, a lot. And anyway, that freezer is sitting there. So it made a tabletop. And we didn't have tables or anything. You know, we just come from the Air Force. I... I brought everything, all of our possessions were in the two-ton, my red two-ton truck, the big Chevrolet truck that I have, the 66. Uh, you guys may have seen it, but that's a story too in itself, that truck. But anyway, everything we owned was in that truck. It was me, Jill, and our five kids. Uh, my parents-in-law helped us move, and they hauled some stuff too, and I guess we did have a rider truck as well, but not a big one, just like a van. Um, but anyway, uh, we didn't have much when we started here. and But we did raise our own chickens, and we were going to process those chickens. We were we had heard about this thing called a chicken plucker. I'd never seen one. I had no idea how a chicken plucker could work, but a guy told me about an Amish guy that had a chicken plucker. And I went and looked at it. He says, oh, it works fine. But he wasn't going to use it. They were getting ready to move. Didn't have a motor on it. They hooked it to a, like a lawnmower to make it run. He sold it to me for, I don't know, 150 bucks. I brought it home. I bolted a motor to it that I had. And it worked. And you know, it went around anyway. So then we decided we were going to try it out. And we were trying it out. Okay, Sean Wise is with us. Ben Carlson's with us. Life after the Air Force. That's a good story. Yeah, that is a good story, brother. We should talk about that. Yeah, but it gets better. It gets better. It, it, it down, for me, it was down and then up. And now it's, it's okay. But you just got to gotta know what you're in for. <laughs> oh, boy, that's a, that's a story. Every day, every single day I think about it. But anyway, um, we were processing chickens just for my family, and a lady pulled in that, who was the veterinarian, and she pulled in because we were homeschoolers, and she was kind of a ringleader in the whole homeschooling community, and she had pulled in to kind of get to know us. And, oh, wow, yeah, hi, how you doing? And, oh, you guys process chickens, huh? And we said, doesn't everybody? And uh, apparently not. And she said, would you like to process the chickens for the youth show? And I said, I don't even know what the youth show is. And so she explained it to us and it would only be about 30 chickens. I was still in that air force mentality. Really. When somebody asks you to do something, you feel obligated to do it. You know, I would, I would always do what I was asked to do, no matter who asked me to do it. And so I said, well, yeah, I guess. And that began it. And uh, we started, the word got around that we processed chickens and we had people calling us and we'd schedule them in. And that first year, we processed about 1,500 birds, we figured. And we just did it on that concrete slab down there. Old broken up concrete slab, by the way. And... Then I started thinking, you know, that was better than a sharp stick in the eye. Maybe we should do it again. And uh, so we thought, well, let's just put up, you know, a, uh, a roof over it. That would be good enough. Just keep the rain off of us. And we did that. And then somebody suggested, 
you know, you should really think about processing deer for people during deer hunting season. So I said, oh, is there a lot of capital in that? Is there money in that? Oh, yeah, yeah, you can get $75 per deer to process it, which at the time, you know, that's one thing being in the Air Force, you really don't have that, you don't have that good of a grasp on your time versus dollars. At least I didn't, because you get paid according to your rank, you know, not how hard you work during the day. You know, some days you work hard, some days you don't work at all, you know. So I didn't have a good grasp on that. And I thought, gee, $75 a deer, that sounds pretty good. But, you know, you take into consideration all that you have to do and then you have to hang on to it and then deliver it back to the person. I don't mean bring it to them, but they have to come and pick it up. And it'd be kind of nice if they came and got it this year, but that doesn't always happen. So there's a lot of things that you don't know that's coming when you say, yeah, that sounds like a good idea. So anyway, we did that. We wound up putting sides on the butcher shop. And then I bought some windows and put those in. And then, hey, let's heat this place. We'll work here in the wintertime. So we insulated it. And then we put uh, OSB on the inside and then put some some stuff over that that would resist uh, water and stuff. And we didn't have water in the shop at first. We were just running a hose from a, a frost-free uh hydrant that was in the that was in the yard actually and so when we wanted to work in the shop we had nothing but cold water and we'd have to turn it on and then as soon as the water wasn't flowing you had to go back outside and turn it off or it could freeze and that happened so we knew uh about that okay i got it I got a barking dog outside. So I just have to text my wife about barking dogs. Maybe she'll come out and shoot them with the BB gun. And so that's how our butcher shop was built. I mean, I had some ideas of what I wanted to do, but it really just was the need was the mother of invention on it. You know, it just happened. And then when we wanted to uh, do more, we added on to it. And that's where we are right now. We have the same butcher shop that we've had here for uh, 19 years, going on 19 years probably. And it's only just recently, and, and I mean very recently, that we've decided that we're going to, move the butcher shop to a, a different building. Um, there's another building that we used for our maintenance. And we've just recently put windows in there and it's, it's much bigger. It's 14 by 40. So it's still not a huge building, but it's much bigger than what we have. And we've decided to do that because the butchering is it's, it is that important. I I cannot stress how important it is. So anyway, our summer was kind of cut short. We didn't make it to the lake more than one time because we were working so much butchering chickens. Um, and even yesterday when it was our last day, somebody called and pleaded with Jill and Jill agreed to, to do their three turkeys last night and 20 something chickens. And so last night at six o'clock, you know, our, our customers from the day are wheeling in, getting their chickens, picking them up and leaving. It's dark out. You know, all the kids are down in the shop. We're still working. I was down there till nine o'clock last night and I'm not complaining because see, this is the thing about homesteading. If you find something that you can do, on your homestead platform, and it makes a reasonable amount of money or a good amount of money, and I'm telling you butchering makes good money, right? Then it may not be something that you want to do, but if you want that lifestyle, you may have to do what you have to do, right? So that's us. We worked two days a week. 
this summer, and some weeks they were even three days a week. A lot of birds. People really got tired of it, but it it works. You know, it 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 makes enough money that it makes sense to do, and you can't turn it down. You know, even even though we have better things going, but they're not as consistent as chicken processing, and this is an important one too. You learn this in the homesteading game because homesteading is not just making stuff, growing stuff, fixing stuff. It's also selling stuff. You got to have marketing. You got to have some way of getting your products in front of people. You do because most people who are homesteading eventually would like to just have their platform that they work off of, their homestead platform, they would like that to be it. They would like to be able to stay there. You know, I ran into a guy last weekend, their homestead, he's got an office. He's a money manager of some sorts. I didn't quite understand what it was. I didn't press him for the details, but he has an office at his homestead. So his wife makes him lunch every day. You know, he gets to get off work right and then go out and play with the kids. Um, He gets to work on his homestead. He gets to go out and do, uh, you know, physical stuff on his homestead where his job is at a computer. Um, A lot of people like that. But so more and more, we're looking at the homestead as a platform. It's a place, right? And you can do a lot of stuff off of it. It doesn't necessarily have to be... um, your main thing is eggs, for instance. It doesn't have to be. Your main thing could be a house painting business that you run off of there. And um, you're gone to do your house painting, but then when you come home, you're at your homestead. And your homestead produces your food and your recreation. And it's a place. It needs to be a place of solace, I think, for me. I wouldn't want to be on a homestead that was just a crazy place. Like with barking dogs all the time, you know, that would drive me crazy. Try to shoot from here. You can get a better shot at them. (laughs) We have a, an airsoft gun and Jill opens the door and unleashes a hail of airsoft bullets on her. It's our old female. She just, she barks for her puppies, I think. Boo, boo, boo. Yeah, right outside the door. Right there. Right outside the door. Yeah. All right, so um, so this subject comes up, how to set up your butcher shop. And, and I, I really don't want to say, well, you should put this here and this here and the flow of it and all that stuff. That's, that's really something that you would figure out. Um, I really want to talk about a butcher shop as an integral part of a livestock management program. I mean, it's, it just makes so much sense. All right. And as I just demonstrated to you, there's a real need for it because we were slammed all summer long. Yesterday was our last day, and the kids today, we were I was riding with them in the car, and I said, you know what we got to do this Friday? And he said, what? I said, not butcher chickens. And they were pretty happy. And I will tell you this, that I, the new shop that we're building out, um, it, you know, like we're not putting in a new roof or anything like that. It's already there. It was just used for maintenance, and we've made some changes to it, cleaned it up so it can be, you know, you can have food and stuff in there. And, um, we want to expand our chicken line so we're more efficient. Right now, we're not all that efficient, to be honest with you. You know, there's a lot of steps in there that require um, physical work that doesn't need to be done. There are things like wheels that we could utilize and levers and other simple machines that we just haven't done because we've never needed to do this much chicken processing. So, and I do plan on changing out some of our equipment for a little bit more updated stuff that is a little bit more automated, right? Um, so that 
we can do the same amount, but it just takes less of our life to do it. You see what I'm saying? That's what efficiency is about. It's like I spend more of my precious time on earth here. Um, I, I spend less of my time doing something like that, but I'll still make the same amount of money that I can spend on doing the stuff I want to do. I hope that makes sense. $10 a chicken in Virginia. Yeah, well, I, wow. That's a lot. That's a lot. But, you know, I can see it because, especially with turkeys, I can see it. Because if if I say somebody, it's $10 to do a turkey, they that's a lot. And then I say, you have options. You could do it yourself. Go ahead. Because really, $10 is not all that much money. Well, I shouldn't say that. It really is. $10 is a lot of money. It'll buy me two, two gallons of gasoline and two bucks left over. That's, that's not bad. On two gallons of gasoline, I can go a long ways on that, right? So I have a little bit different take on the price of gasoline. Actually, it's quite cheap. With what you can do with it, it is quite cheap. We're just used to joyriding, though, and we want it for five, you know, we want to fill the tank for five bucks so we can joyride. You know, that's kind of dumb. If you if you use a vehicle the way it's supposed to be used for business purposes only, you can you get you get a lot of punch out of that four bucks, that gallon of gasoline. You get a lot of punch out of that. And if you if you doubt that, my van, the man van, can go probably twenty miles on uh, a gallon of gasoline. So that would get me into Cadillac and another gallon of gasoline would get me home. But if I were to walk to Cadillac, it would take me all day. If I were to take a horse and wagon, it would take me till lunch. But I can drive in there in 20 minutes and drive back. And it cost me $8 in fuel and less an hour of my time. That's pretty good. Like, let's say that I need a part that I have to go to Cadillac to get. Let's say I had to take a horse and wagon. It would be a day, you know, getting there and getting back. It would be a day. So you consider the, the amount of work that you can do with a gallon of gasoline. It's, it really is good. It really is good. Okay, so setting up a butcher shop on your farm. I, I don't think there's anything that I harp on more than this because we got into it early and I think it made the difference between a success and a failure because um, we could always fall back on butchering and there's always money to be made in that. There's always a need for animals to be processed, always. And that's not going to come to a close. As a matter of fact, um, I was on my Facebook page, and I'm a member of a, a, um, a group called, let's see if it'll come right up. It, it's um, Backyard Butcherers. Let's see if I can find it. Well, um, it's got very interesting articles and techniques and things like that. And so I am a member there. I never say anything. I always just listen to what other people say. And there was a guy that came on tonight. It was uh, an article that he had wrote, and it was lengthy. He put a lot of time into it. You could tell um, he took time to write it, a lot of time to write it, and uh his gist was why you shouldn't get into small processing facilities, why that's not a good idea. And he went on for a long time talking about why it's no good, why there's no money in it, why you wind up giving your life to it. You spend 14 hours a day there and the, the margins are very narrow and 
you're never going to make it. You might as well just cut your own throat. Life sucks. My wife ran off with the plumber. You know, he just on and on and on and on. And then I there was 104 comments. And I said, I got to read some of these comments. People are going to tear this guy up. And strangely enough, I really want to find this because I want you guys to be able to read this. It was kind of pitiful, I thought. Um, strangely enough, everybody agreed with him. Oh, such beautiful words that you've written here. So eloquent of how what losers we would be for getting into backyard butchering. Well, you know, I can't find this stupid thing now. On and on and on it went. People were saying, that's right. Uh, I've been doing this for 20 years and I've been poor the whole time. And, you know, I'm about ready to commit suicide. And on and on it went. And, okay, here it is. Here it is. I found it right there. Ooh. Well, it's having a hard time. So, anyway. It's called DIY Meat Processing Facilities, right? And the guy's name that wrote this is uh, Russell D. Oliver, 20 hours ago. Reflections upon my exit from the meat industry. Five years ago, we built a plant, invested more money than I could have imagined. Had big dreams and ultimately failed. These are the things I wish someone would have told me going into this. And I would have listened. I wouldn't have listened back then, but I digress, he says. And he's got, you know, one through one through 15. Um, reasons why it's not going to work, why you're going to fail. And... I mean, I was I was looking for, I read it, almost the whole thing, and then I said, I don't even want this in my head. I don't want to hear this. Because, and he tells you right off, he spent more money than he could ever have imagined to build a facility. Um, now, and I've just got done telling you how well my butcher shop has done this summer and how it's met our needs, and then some. And now we're having to expand because, uh, you know, because there's so much to do, right? There's so much work to do. And this guy is is telling you why you shouldn't do it. And he he spends a lot of, look at, he's, he, there's a lot of, oh boy. Let's see, how long is it? It's it's probably five, six pages of writing. 140 comments. There was 104, now there's 140. And I'll read you some of the comments. I'm not going to lie, this was hard to read as someone who has always wanted to get into the industry. Thank you so much for your invaluable insights. I wish more people from more industries would be honest with the future generations like this. So here's a guy who's always wanted to get into this, but now he's not going to. Now he's not going to. You just convinced him not to. Well, I don't think he really wanted to get into it, but it's a good thing you told him because he would have failed too. Well, now he's actually, he's failed. <laughs> Uh, okay, thanks for taking the time to share. I hope it helps someone middle-aged from blowing their nest egg after being lured into by government freebies. I'm glad I, I started in the family business, was a strong buck and weak mid, weak mind, and very lucky to see processing go f from 27 cents to $1.10 in 23 years. Uh, anyway, and, and, I, I read it and it was just a bunch of people. Yeah, you're right. There's no sense in working hard. 
Oh, uh, Jay Z, you read that? Was that pitiful or what? I don't even want to know that guy, right? All the reasons why you're going to fail because the because I failed. Get away! I would not want to share a bus ride with that individual ever. You know, you, you there's no way you could have adjusted things. All across the United States, people eat meat every day. Somebody's got to process those animals, and there are processing facilities that have been around for generations, but they're all failing, right? That's what he wants us to know. How stupid is this? There's a guy that lives down the road from me. His name's Tim. He's got a really nice house. As far as I can tell, he lives a pretty good life. He owns a butcher shop over on, on 66 that's been around, I think their their parents started it, and now his ki- kids have it, right? And I was talking with a guy last night, the principal of the middle school, actually, and he said they're slammed. They are doing so well in that thing. So don't listen to that stuff, And but, but I want to flesh this out a little bit. A lot of the people that get into this, DIY um, backyard butchering. They're not actually back, backyard butchers like I am. They're building facilities that they're going to have an office in there for a USDA guy to be there all the time and two or three, maybe a veterinarian and stuff. They're wanting to do a fully inspected, full partnership with the USDA. And that's really not what I'm talking about. I actually recommend that you don't do that because anytime you partner with a government bureaucracy, you're partnering with people who are not required to hustle, right? They're paid whether they're asleep or awake, they're paid. So when you're the proprietor of an abattoir or a butcher shop, you're damn right you're going to hustle. You're going to work hard. It's not easy, but nothing is. Nothing is easy. You know, if you want to be in the homesteading business, it's not easy. And we're not saying, oh, this is a great lifestyle. You know, you'll have a yacht and you will travel and it'll be easy and people will wait on you. That's not what this is. If, if you thought it was, time to flip the page. Yeah. He's, well, jay Z saying the main thing in the article is that he went big out of the gate and failed. He said that he should have went small and then, look, he made the decision to go big because he didn't, do, he didn't plan very well. If he had gone small, do you think he would have planned better or the same? He made bad decisions. Going big, he made bad decisions. He probably would have made bad decisions going small, right? But just because you make a bad decision doesn't mean you can't adjust, right? He was saying that, well, I thought my electric bill was going to be $500 a month. Turns out it was $4,500 a month. You thought, what, did you just pull that number, you know, out of your back pocket? I mean, you're going to be running HVAC equipment, Um. 24-7 24-7 in a butcher shop like that. Yeah, <laughs> you should get some concrete numbers on what your energy uh, needs are going to be instead of just thinking it'll be $500 a month. I'm talking about a totally different animal here. I don't, I don't think at this point in my life I would want to start a butcher shop like that, you know, with... Uh, uh, the year-round, um, 10 beef a week butcher shop, I, I don't believe I would want to do that. And I will probably explain to you why in the course of the show. But I'm talking about building a uh, homestead outfit. Huh. What's going on here? I just touched a button. Okay, Haven says, I think his first mistake was spending more money than he could afford. That's usually a problem no matter what business you're starting. Darn right. I mean, 
Yeah. Um, there was there was a lot of problems with that article, and I think it's a good article to read and to go and flush the toilet. So, so you have that that sound in your head. You know, get rid of it, flush it. Um, read so you know what a defeatist sounds like. Right? You don't have to be that person. Okay, so building a backyard butcher shop, building a uh, a homestead butcher shop. Let's say. <clears throat> now I'm. I'm 18 years down the road on this. This isn't something uh, – uh-oh, what's going on from here? Hide message from stream. Ah, this technology is killing me. All right, Jeremy's – don't ever get into technology. It, it'll ruin your business and you'll fail. Don't do it. Um, don't ever start up a radio show like this. Don't do it. it it's just it, defeatists and you'll die. Okay. Okay. De- Dion says regulated versus free market constitutional butcher shop. Yeah, we're going to, I guess we'll talk about that. And then there's a, a thing here from Jeremy and it's okay. Bad management can run any business into the ground. For some reason... That is showing up right under my picture here, and I didn't know why. Maybe it's something I did. But anyway. Okay, I'm talking about a homestead butcher shop, and it's primarily to process the animals that you raise. So what that really comes down to is you're keeping all of your processes in-house, right? And why would you want to keep all those processes in-house? Well, I can think of a few reasons. One uh, just the satisfaction of doing it yourself, um, the convenience of doing it yourself. And you might think, well, that really didn't look that convenient there Saturday when you guys were butchering those massive steers. Well, actually, it was convenient because we were done by a little after lunchtime, like 2 o'clock. And... Um, If I had loaded those steers up in a trailer and taken them an hour and a half away, unloaded them, and then turned around and come back, it would have been about the same time. And then we were done. We, we were done with the first day of it. Um, if I had taken them someplace, I'd have to go back after them again and bring them home. So it's just transport is a day. It is a day which I don't have that, you know. Uh, Another reason why I want to do it myself is those animals were majestic, beautiful animals. These, they were Hereford steers. They were three years old. They've lived here their entire lives. (coughs) Do I want to turn them over to $10 an hour employees? Do you? Now, part of the guy, what the guy said in this article is you can't find help. Yeah, because they pay $10, you know. Um, The USDA runs a lot of these shops, so they can't have Mexicans in there. (laughs) They'd probably work if they did. Um, But they pay their employees 10 bucks an hour, so sometimes your steaks come back, you know, half an inch thick. Sometimes they come back two inches thick. Sometimes they don't even come back, you know. Sometimes you get somebody else's stuff back. and, And it really does happen because I raise Mangalitsa pigs and the pork from Mangalitsa is really different than other pork. And you can tell it's got a, a massive fat cap on the pork chops. If you look at the bacon, they look like they're almost pure fat. But when you cook them up, they, they don't really perform that well. And I've got bacon back from somebody else. And I even brought it back to them and he says, well, let me see what I can do about this. And he took it back. And then I never heard from him again because it's just so busy that he forgot, you know, about it. He's a friend of mine, you know, and I never pressed it. But um, So when you have this process going on at your house, and let's say you become proficient in processing a beef, a beef cow, um, it, it, it's not brain surgery. It really isn't. 
Um, it's quite forgiving if you accidentally, as uh, you know, a twenty-five dollar an hour employee, cut one of your one of your steaks at three quarters, and the next one you cut it at one inch. Oh well, it'll it'll work out. It still there's a a saying in butchering: it will make a turd. You know, it will work out. Um, and well, this uh, the the feeling of personal achievement. You get that feeling of personal achievement because you're doing it at home, right? You're doing it at home. Um, and then nowadays, with what has happened with the um, the Wu flu that came from some place a far away, um, a lot of a lot of shops got shut down. Because they're partnering with the USDA, and the USDA actually holds the ace, they can shut the place down if they want to. Um, some of them were shut down. This one that I'm talking about was shut down. Because the USDA man came up with the Wu flu, even though he wasn't sick, he was asymptomatically on the verge of death. And so they had to shut this down so they could scrub every inch of it. Just ridiculous, but that's what happened, and uh, now they are backed up, and they'll be backed up forever. You know, it seems like because articles like this, people read them, and they they say, "Ooh, I would never want to do that. I would never want to, you know, provide this service for people who desperately need it." And we'll, you know, like last night, we processed three turkeys for a guy that, hey, we're closed. He he says, "What what will it take to?" turn everything back on. I said, well, $20 a bird. He's like, no problem. No problem. All right. When people are desperate, you know, is he going to do it himself before now and uh, Thanksgiving? No. You know, and I don't feel as though, I mean, we had to turn everything back on. And, and so we just made that decision to do that. Um, so let's talk about the available of processing in the United States of America right now. It's not good. All kinds of not good stories about it. You know, it used to be that if I called up to Triple R, I could get an appointment next week. If I called middle of the week this week, I'd get in next week. And you'd go there and they were moderately busy. All the employees are working everybody's happy and you know you paid i don't know 80 cents a pound hanging weight for your your beef to be processed i think it was uh we just haven't used anybody not nothing against them i mean i like those guys but we just decided hey we're going to do it ourselves because we're spending too much time on the road going and coming and it was just um, made no sense because we have a butcher shop here, you know, and then we started to understand how the restrictions work and the laws and all that stuff and come to find out there really ain't any laws, this restrictions, but you don't have to really got, go by that if you just don't buy into their contract. You do what you want. You do it under the Fifth Amendment and you're good and nobody really cares. <laughs> you know, the only way they care is if you enter into a contract with them and then you violate the contract, then they'll have you in court. And it's the same as any other contract. If I have a contract with, you know, <clears throat> Dion to set up my pool and he only does it halfway, I would have to take him to court to have, you know, either the, the money that I've already given him returned or have him finish the job. It's just a civil matter, right? So you just never get in any kind of an agreement with the Department of Agriculture or the U.S. Department of Agriculture, and there's just no problem. You know, you on your private property, you kill a cow, you cut it into pieces. Um, you might be good at it, or you might not be real good at it, but still, you can, you can perform these processes and get a product out the door and if you sell it to somebody and they buy it and they agree to buy it then you have a contract with them that's all good you know if they don't like the looks of it they won't buy it and then if they buy it and then they 
decide it's not good and they bring it back, then you can go from there. But um, butchering goes sort of like this. Uh, you have to get a, a whole series of processes down to a place where you're somewhat proficient at it. Somewhat. Uh, the first time you, you do one of these things, are you going to be proficient? No. It might work. It might not. But you got to have a plan B. Okay, so with our cows, um, we have to be able to get them inside someplace separated from the other cows. And also a place where we can get a chain around their back foot and pull them out of where they're going to be in when we do the shooting. Um, I remember the first time that I ever shot a cow. I, I remember it just very well. And um, <clears throat> it just happened to work. You know, I had seen a friend of mine, Dan Isaacson, out in Montana do it like 15 times. He used a 22 long rifle. He would lean it on the mirror of his one ton dually, uh, real old Chevy pickup that's rumbling away there, you know, and he's just leaning it on that and he would shoot. And every single time that cow went down, every single time, I never saw one even flinch, you know, all four feet come off the ground and down. And then he would pull up, <clears throat> roll them over, go to work on them with a knife about that long. I'm not kidding. And every move he made produced. I never saw anybody work like that even since. I've never seen anybody butcher like that guy. And um, he was the one that actually got me started on it <clears throat> because I was so thrilled watching his work. And uh, there was other circumstances, but... Um, uh, yeah, I, I learned a lot from him and, um, uh, but the first time I shot a cow, I did it with an M1 carbine and, uh, the cow went straight down, you know, and since then I have used the carbine just about every time until I started going to a 22 mag. And then Devin was here this weekend and he said, oh, you got to use this gun. This gun's way better. It's a 32 special. It'll knock them straight down. And, all right. So I, I did. And it, yeah, I did. Um, knocked him straight down. So you got to learn that's a process to shoot the cow. And then you got to learn how to bleed the cow. Um, David knows it different than I do it. I make a cut right here and I make it big enough that I can get my hand in and I go in far right to where the heart is. And I clip that cluster of valves and it just bleeds out so fast. He did one of these like that. I don't do that because it's, it's messy. Um, and so you learn all these separate processes. And when you've gotten through all of these processes, like broke, breaking the animal down into primals and then from primals into subprimals, and, you know, trimming up the steaks and, making the burger and all that stuff. And then you finally get it into your freezer and then you take a piece out from the freezer and it goes into the pan and you fry it up or under the broiler or onto the grill or whatever. And then you eat that, you know that you have been involved or been the, the, the main thrust on this process from the time it was a calf until the time it was a, a steak, you know, and that's really a good thing. I had beef for dinner tonight. Um, I do well on beef. You know, I could eat nothing but beef and do fine. I could, I could eat it every single meal, but I really usually only eat like once a day when I'm eating beef a lot. <clears throat> and then I'll kind of might have something like a snack or something, but usually just beef and milk and coffee and, and, and salt. That's it. And water. That's it. I can live on that. So for me, uh, beef processing is, is something that I want to get better at. So setting up your butcher shop, you need a place where after you've shot your pig or shot your cow, that you can somehow 
lift it up from there. So if you could, you know, these cows weren't exactly tame, but I couldn't put a rope on them and pull them underneath a tree. That There's no way I could do that. They were huge. Um, but the only thing we do is get in there with two guys with, you know, with uh, paddles, sticks, and, you know, guide them until they were in the corral. And then we shut the door behind us. And it's actually the milking corral. <clears throat> and then when they came over and, and looked at me, I, I shot them. And, uh, yeah, it was good. Got a chain on them. Then lifted them up a little ways. Um, kind of cradled them on the ground, just right on the ground. Put cord wood under them so that their legs are straight up and they would stay there. And then you just go to skinning. So you just run your knife under the skin, just down, and then all the way to the middle of the chest. And then the same thing from the other side, and then up here to the head, and then down belly to, you know, out the legs. And then you just start working that hide back. They're laying on the hide. And then you we use the front end loader to lift them up. Now, if you didn't have a front end loader, let's say that you had a um, a set of poles that you could set up and then you had a chain hoist. That would work. It would be a little cumbersome. I don't know if I'd run them. But let's say you just had an area that you could run them into and you could reach that with a chain from a, a heavy beam in the barn. You know, that might be an option, although the light wouldn't be real good in the barn. You know, I like being outside because it's good light. And you can see. All right. So there's you got to You got to have all these components kind of fit together. Like in my case, if we go out with the rest of the cop and shoot the cow out there, the rest of the cows don't like that. They get highly upset. If, if one walks into the barn, we shut the door and he never walks out. They just, I don't think they dig on that. They don't, you know, they don't, they, they don't get it, but you shoot one of them in front of the rest of them. I don't like doing that. We did that one year and we said, we're not going to do that again because they got very upset. And then my milk cows were kind of like, hmm, I'm not sure about you anymore. I don't know if I want to give you any milk or maybe I want to give you chocolate milk. I'm drinking milk, by the way. Baker's Green Acres Cup. Isn't that a cool cup? This milk is so good. It is so good. Beef and milk. should be a diet. Well, then you got to have a place where you can lift it up high enough because we're going to, we're going to take, we're going to cut out around the bung, around the back end of the cow, the butthole, and we're going to saw the sternum so that the guts will just roll forward. They will actually roll right out of the animal. Um, they're really heavy. And then you got to have a way to get them out of there. If you can get the cow up high enough, you can roll them out right into a wheelbarrow. You can take out what you want and then the rest of it you can just wheel off because it's like these cows that we did, it was like 500 pounds. I'm not kidding. The stomach was huge. And uh, in my case, I just put the bale spear on my front end loader and speared it and then took it and dumped it in with the pigs. It was a massive pile of guts and when I brought the second one out there the first one was gone it was absolutely gone there was not even a trace of it all the grass that's in the cow's belly gone and there's only like 15 pigs out there they just annihilated it and then when I dropped the second in with them they annihilated that one too I don't know if they completely finished it that day but I was out there again today gone you there's not a trace that you drop that in there and it's legitimate it's not um it's not well it's not illegitimate it's not like i'm feeding them something that they shouldn't have it's um a perfectly legitimate thing to do um you wouldn't 
fault me if I was feeding them T-bones, but I'm just feeding them like liver. Not the, not all of it, but like, and the intestines and stuff. And they can, they like all that stuff. So anyway, you got to be able to get that out there. Um, and I did that. I was able to do that because I have the front end loader that helps me out a lot. But the new facility that I'm building, I might have to go to the whiteboard for this to show you what I'm doing. Because maybe if I make the case to you that this is something you should think about doing, you know, even if you do it just for your family, if you can process all your own chickens, all your own pigs and all your own cattle, maybe you still have a job off the farm, you know. And this is really going to make it a lot easier for you because you can get together with your family members and have a hog butchering weekend and it'll be fun. Maybe um, it is for us. We, we like it. Um, all my boys came over on Saturday and that was the idea. Um, I got to get a pen here so I can go to the, the whiteboard. Let's see. I used that color before. All right. Well, I'll use peach today. And I'll I'll show you a couple of things that I'm going to do in our new building. Um, this is the floor space. It looks something like this. This is the... It's a lean-to off the barn, actually. And this is... 15 by 40, right? And there's a big door here, and there's a back door here, but I won't be using that. That's a personnel door. Um, I got a little bit of a rail in the middle here, a rail meaning like a... Hmm. Like, uh, it's, it's up at ceiling level and this one is up 12 feet high and there's a doll, there's a trolley that's on that. And on that trolley, I can put a chain hoist so I can lift stuff up, stuff up. And I actually have beef hanging in there right now, but it's, when I put it in there, I, it was a maintenance shop. So it was a place we could lift heavy equipment up and like pole engines and things like that. And uh, was never really intended for a butcher shop, but that's what it's being used for now. So right outside here, uh, I have cattle. This is their, their, here's their loafing shed and the barn is right here. Boy, did I pick a loser of a pen? Brand new. Let me get another one. Maybe I'll go to chartreuse or something will work better. Hmm. There we go. All right. So uh, this is all concrete here, but it's outside and there's no roof over it. Uh, we're going to be putting a rail in about like this, about this far. And this roof is going to be continued down. So we'll be under roof, but this will be heated. This will not. So most of our butchering doesn't require any kind of HVAC. We just... Uh, work with the seasons. I don't want to be butchering beef in the summertime because uh, that's when we have issues with flies and things like that. And plus, I got too much other stuff going on in the summertime to be butchering beef. That's not the right time to do it. Oh, after you butcher a beef, oh, you can't even see this on there, can you? Okay, I'm going to get the whole thing of them. I don't know why they're up here anyway. Now they're not up here. Now they're down here on the table where I use them. All right, let's try white.
Huh, that one's broken, I can tell from looking at it. Yellow? I'll try yellow. That looks like a good one. This is all concrete here. Um, and my cows usually are hanging around out here if they're not out in this. This is a lane that goes out into the entire complex. So they come up here to get milked. The milking facility is up here. It's in the barn. Um, <clears throat> so when I want them over here is where eventually I'm going to have a little killing pen. And so we'll build a fence up against the building right here. And there'll be a gate here that when we open this gate and we push the cattle, we can push the one that we want into the chute and it'll walk down here. And as soon as he goes into the end here, we can throw a pipe in behind him and he's stuck. He can't back up. And then when we do the chute, then there'll be a gate that we just break open and he'll fall onto the concrete. They call it a knock box. Um, and that's, that's more uh, of the, the layout and the flow of a, of a processing facility that I'm not really going to go into here. Uh, it, it's, it's not super complex. Uh, it's just, it depends what you already have of what you want to add. You know, if you were going to build one from scratch, that would be a totally different story. And there's actually some pretty good plans online. Um, but I think what I'm trying to do is make it the case for endeavoring to do this because it, it puts you at a completely different place and you're not at the mercy of the processors that are out there and suffering with the problems that this guy had, right? It doesn't, you know, you don't have to deal with that. Anyway, I'm not, uh, this heater is bothering me tonight. What's going on? I don't feel like I'm as on as I usually am. Let's see what we got. You say I can't. You are right. If you say I can and do, you are right. That's right. The other odd thing was he said he had a good job and let his wife run it all. He had no skin in the operation. Huh. I didn't even catch that part of it. Nancy's with us from Shaw Lake Homestead. Welcome. Stark Raving Ranch. Can one just feed the entire gut pile to pigs raw or does it need to be? No, you know, yeah, you just feed it. Just feed it. Yeah, you sure can. I've been doing it for years. There's nothing wrong with that. Um, okay, let's see if I am where I wanted to be on this discussion about building a facility on your place. Okay, so what are the minimums that you need? Uh, I guess the minimums would be someplace where you could lift the animal up, right? Uh, but is that even necessary? I guess I'm going to have to say no, it isn't necessary because I've told you this story before. I was down in Bolivia for a little trip one time, and I was at a place where I was watching a, uh, a market that was going on in the street, and uh, so I was intently watching what was going on there and there was a guy that would I was there for two weeks and there was a guy that would walk down a beef cow or some sort of cow uh, they didn't have the same breeds that we have here uh, into this marketplace and I never did really see exactly how he did it but before you knew it the thing was dead and it was on the ground and it was laying with his legs straight up in the air and then he would go to work with just a knife, skinning, 
skinning, skinning, skinning. And it was in their winter, but it was still hot down there. And uh, by the time he left the market in the afternoon, uh, everything was gone and he rolled the hide up. And I think someone even took the hide, right? The hooves, somebody took them. There was nothing left, right? It all went. And he did not even have a hoist to pick it up. So I, I, as I remember, we did a, a beef up at Susan, Susan Greaves' house, and we didn't have a tractor to lift that up either, I don't think. I think we cut it right on the ground. So the way I did that was we rolled the cow to the side and opened her up, cut around the butt, cut through the brisket, when it was still up straight, rolled it to the side and then just rolled the guts out onto the ground and then pulled them away. And then, you know, the hooves are off, the hides off. Then we took a saw and sawed down through the backbone all the way front to back and then quartered it at between the sixth and seventh rib, I think. It was a smaller cow. These ones that we did Saturday, they were huge. Um, I could never handle that by hand, that quarters, those quarters. Um, but this one, we were able to handle it by hand, so I could pick a front quarter up and take it into the barn, and then she put a loop over a, a beam and dropped it down and hung on to this and then I let it go and it was hanging there. And so they were able to leave their beef hanging for, I think, 10 days before they cut it up. So you don't really even need a tree to hoist the cow up in. <coughs> you can, this will be my, my pitch for the, uh, the beef processing class. You can get a huge advantage on this process by taking a class where people are actually going to show you it, the entire thing. You're get to, going to get to see it in real life, the entire thing. And then participate in breaking the, the quarters down into primals and the primals into subprimals. And once you know this, right, let's say the class is $800 for two days. But once you know this, that's one beef going into a processor. And... You know, another thing I mentioned, the, the employees at, at some of these processing facilities, they change them out all the time. You know, they're, they're transient. They're not dedi real dedicated employees. I mean, th there are some, but most of the times they're transient. And they really don't care how wasteful they are. Anything that goes in the scrap bucket, they just don't have to deal with it. It's gone. Um, I remember at this one place I used to go to, there would be barrels of heads, barrels and barrels and barrels. And then a guy would come around. He's the, uh, I forget what they call him. I think it's the knacker. And he would pick all that stuff up and take it in and render it. And um, so they didn't take any of the meat off the head because the USDA didn't think that was a good idea. Um, I These beef that... I processed uh, on Saturday, I think it was Sunday night. I was waiting for somebody to come drop off chickens and turkeys Sunday night. Yeah. And I pulled those heads in and scun them back and took the cheeks off. And I weighed the cheeks up and they were like two pounds. So on two heads, I got, you know, eight pounds of really nice meat, really nice clear meat. Um, and we've learned a process called uh, Sean Kelly mentioned it to me a, a while ago and it's called uh, wet aging. And then uh, Devin and I talked about it with Jill on Saturday. And the way this works is when you get a, so you kill a beef and you cool it enough so you can handle it. If it's not cool, it's hard to handle because uh, it's slippery. But once it cools, it sets up. And then let's say you cut 
some really nice steaks off, you put them in cryovac. That's like a vac seal machine, a good vac seal machine. And you vac seal them and you crank it up so you take all the air out of them. It'll even kind of squish them down a little bit. But then you leave them in the refrigerator for five days. And if there are no problems, i.e. the bag isn't puffing up, then, then you freeze them. And then once they get off being frozen, um, you've got meat that is just as good as if you hung it for 10 days. Because you're, you're doing it to a much smaller piece of meat. So the, the enzymes will propagate through there on a cut piece of meat very quickly at refrigerator temperatures, but at freezer temperatures, they, they hold, right? So that, this is why we do a 10 day hang on a half a beef. You're hanging it at 36 degrees. You don't want it below freezing or else the, it will not, um, it will not age well. And aging of beef is basically a slowed down rotting, right? If you shoot a beef out in the middle of the field and leave it there, eventually it won't be there. It will go back to the earth. Um, and it's, there's, there's components in the meat that are designed to self destruct if it's, if it's left. Right. So it's, everything's designed to go back. We're designed to go back to the earth unless somebody pumps us full of preservatives and then they put us in a concrete box. You know, not a good idea. All right. Let's see. Can we, okay. Off grid with Dave and Sonia. Donnie is the bell next to the subscription button selected to all. Okay. Donnie's saying, I never get notification for this channel. Luckily, I stumble across the streams from time to time when it's live. Well, maybe Sonia's got a good thing for you to do there. All right. All right, so you're going to... You're going to put together a butchering facility on your homestead. You've decided that you're going to do it. What is a, where's a good place to start? Um, I would say some, some minimums that you should consider. You don't need, but you should consider is something about 14 feet high that you can put a chain hoist on and you can hoist the animal up. That's going to make it a lot easier for you. You would need a good set of knives, and this is maybe two or three knives. Uh, we just use a six-inch boning knife. We use them for just about everything. They seem to be very good all-purpose knives. Um, a sharpening system for the knives would be good. So if you can get a, a diamond stick or a, a wet stone or an oil stone that works particularly well for you, that would be a good thing. Um Um, then you need a saw, a good hand saw. Did I already say hand saw? Um, we're to the point now where we've actually got a power saw called a well saw that I can cut down a beef. It's, I don't have the more powerful one and that's what I need. I have the one that I use is primarily for pigs. I don't do that many beef, so, but I plan to do more beef. That's the idea of going into the bigger facility It's because there's just a lot of beef around. Now, when you talk about a processing facility on the, on the homestead, um, do I mean a facility where you let people come to you and drop animals off, then you process them and turn them back over to them? Maybe, but not necessarily. I'm not, not, not necessarily saying that. Now, I don't like that. That's custom processing. I don't really like that when it comes to beef, right? Because somebody drops off a huge beef and they come back to pick it up and they get just boxes of beef. And they're, the, the tendency is that people say, oh, is this all of it? Are you sure it's not mixed in with some of the other stuff that's in there? You know, there's a processor down over in Falmouth that I 
used to go to, and I don't go to them anymore, but um, when I would go into their freezer, it was huge. And I thought, I wonder if some of my stuff's in here. You know, did I get all my stuff back? It's like, because the guy that was loading me out, he didn't care. Not really, it didn't seem like. So you, you kind of wonder, you know, if you're getting your stuff back. So that's why I don't like the idea of doing other people's beef. Because all it takes is one person to say, yeah, he ripped me off. And then it starts this this rumor mill. And I don't want to be involved in that. I don't. Uh, when we used to do this for people, there was one guy I did a beef for. And people warned me about working with him. His name was Dan Giefka. And he was a complainer. And he didn't trust anybody who was from the city. And, uh, yeah, I did a beef for him. And he was he said to somebody that I know, yeah, I don't think I got all my beef back. I think they took some of my T-bones. So you don't want to do that. So what, you, what do you want to do? You want to raise your own beef and then process your own beef. That's what you want to do. Because then you're owning the whole process, right? Um, I was telling somebody today about uh, these steers that we that we raised, uh, how much of a gain we made on them. I didn't weigh these steers when we processed them on Saturday, but I would say that they were 2,000 pounds. I would say they were a ton. And where did that weight come from? Where did all that come from? That came from grass. That's it. They have never had a piece of grain. I never gave them grain. Never. And they never even knew what, what, what that was. I mean, when we were trying to entice them to come into the corral so they could be shot, it was like, well, just put some grain down on the ground here and you'll go right after it. I said, nah, he's, it would take him a while to figure out what that is. He's upset right now. He's not going to go looking for something to eat right now. So uh, I didn't really have a lot in this animal, but if you look at the weight that's hanging down in that shop and then just sign a price per pound to it, it's a very valuable animal. There's a lot of, um, a lot of dollars hanging there. If we converted it to dollars, there would be a lot of dollars on the table. And where did it come from? It came from that animal eating grass, chewing grass and swallowing it, and then making 50 pounds of manure per day, right? That made my fields even more fertile than they were when we started. So, uh, yeah, and I didn't have to write a check to the butcher for $1,000 for each animal. You know, that kills you. I mean, you've got this animal, and then $1,000 on top of that. Yeah, but I know where it came from. Yeah, but you paid a lot for it, boy. A lot. Yeah. But if you do it yourself, you're actually paying yourself in beef. You know, spend the day securing my beef for the year, which sustains my life. All right. I uh, I wonder if you guys have any questions for me. I feel like I've gone on long enough about this subject. Um. If not, I'm going to get going. We're not going to do a consulting call this Wednesday. And Thursday, we will not have an interview night because it's Thanksgiving night. So I won't be coming back to you until next Tuesday. I am doing this thing. All right. I was down at the clerics and Beth said to me, you don't make enough videos. And so I thought, you know, I thought about it and I talked to her a little bit about it. I thought, okay, well, I can do that. You know, the day in the life videos, it's really easy to do. Five minute video of just what I'm doing and why I'm doing it. And it's surprising that it's getting a lot of traffic and we're able to drive traffic towards uh, the Anyone Can Farm experience. So, yeah, I'll do it. Makes sense for the business. But I think it also has an impact on people's lives. It, it inspires them and um, equips them in all the things that we're known for. So I'm going to continue to do it. I'm showing the good, the bad, and the ugly. Got the truck stuck the other day. Showed that. All, all, everything like that. <clears throat> you 
you know, the clear span blew apart <laughs> in the wind. Now all that haze got snow on top of it. Yeah, it showed that. We're supposed to have 40s by the end of the week. <sighs> we got like eight inches of snow on the ground, and it's supposed to all be gone by the end of the week. Too bad. Too bad. I'll still be milking cows. All right. We'll see you guys. Thanks, everybody, for coming by. I hope everybody has a really good Thanksgiving. Remember, get out there and get your farming on.